God. Oh, my God. Get the car. Oh, Jesus Christ. Louise, you shot him. Welcome to another episode of Hollywood Gold. I'm your host, Daniela Taplin Lundberg. I'm here with my head of production, Becca Camerata. We run a company called Stay Gold Features. Hey, Bex. Hi. Uh, so we're about to um, embark on an interview with Callie Curry, Thelma and Louise, one of my all-time favorite films. I think one of the most brilliant screenplays I've ever read and seen on screen. Callie is a real hero of mine. I was so excited to get a chance to interview her, and she is an absolute delight. She is hilarious, humble, and brilliant, and she unearthed so many things about not only the film, but the writer's process. So I think this is going to be an incredible journey. Callie Curry, just epically great writer and producer and showrunner. Thank you for being here. Today we're going to talk about them and Louise. And I want you to take us back and just talk about the very seedling of the idea and how it sort of started. I'll start at the very beginning. I was working in music video production, producing, you know, a wide variety of different kinds of music videos. Like what? Like rock? Yeah, just heavy metal. I mean, okay, cool. all different. <laughs> uh, you know, freelance, whatever comes your way. As we do. So I was learning a lot. I had been a theater major and thought I was going to act and then realized very quickly that I didn't enjoy people looking at me that much. So I thought... <laughs> Well, now I better think of something else to do. And I really struggled for years trying to figure out what it was I was supposed to be doing. And I always had this kind of inkling that I could write, but I didn't really pursue it. And had you not written in college at all or previously? No, I had not written. I mean, I had dabbled a little bit in beginning some short stories that I would show to people. And I had written one comedy script with a friend of mine that we just did as a spec thing. And it was uh, not something that I ever really thought about pursuing in any kind of real way. I was very disillusioned with the way women were being represented in film and television, certainly in uh, music videos was the bottom, you know, it was just so depressing. And was this like 87, 80, like late 80s? Yes, it was exactly then. 85 to 80, 88 is when I was doing that. And was in shock that, I mean, you know, there were some fantastic women artists, and they had a little bit of a shot, but even they were just always subjected to this rigid kind of sexualization of their music. And it was just depressing. Yeah. But it wasn't like I wanted to set out to do anything about it. I just kept finding myself feeling very affected by it and and disheartened. And I was driving home one night from a music video shoot. It was like four in the morning. And I pulled up in front of my house in Santa Monica. And I literally had this thought, two women go on a crime spree. Mm. But it wasn't a thought. It was more like I felt the whole movie land in me at once. And it was such a strange, overpowering feeling. I just got the chills. Because I just felt like this must be what it feels like when you suddenly realize you're pregnant or something. You know, it was Uh just like, Uh oh, my God. Now there's this thing and I have to figure out what to do with it. And... Of course, I had never written a screenplay before, and so I didn't really know how to start or where to begin or anything. And I I just kind of marinated the idea for about six months before I started writing. I did a little bit of research, and I just would find myself just thinking about it. Were you reading screenplays at that point? Like, was that part of the freelance no. work you were doing? Not even that. Okay. No. In fact, when I wanted to write, I had to get some screenplays. Okay. And look at them to see how they were formatted. And, you know, because I had never like done anything. And it wasn't like, I mean, but I understood, you know, I'd always been a big reader. 
I had been a theater major. Yeah. I was a movie buff. I loved films. I just, I, I wouldn't have said that I studied them, but of course, you know, if you're interested in something, you're paying attention. And did you have friends in the industry? Like, were you all sort of young people kind of hanging out a bit? Right. Yes. And everybody was trying to move up, you know, I mean, yeah. everybody that I was working with, because I mean, I started as a runner, you know, so we were all trying to get to the next level. I just wasn't sure where this was going to end. I mean, music videos, even at the time, I just thought, wow, this is a tremendous waste of money because they don't really do anything. Like, it's great for breaking a band, but for artists who've been around for quite a while, it doesn't really drive the record. Right. Or at least it didn't then. And so I felt like this is going to be something that's going to go out of style after a while. Right. But I was learning a lot about filmmaking and kind of learning it from a backwards perspective because we weren't telling narrative stories. So right. I just started realizing you have this image, this image, this image, this image, this image. If you can string them all together in a way, that's your story. Right. And so I just started to understand a lot more about thinking in pictures and especially the non-narrative aspect of it mm. made me realize how precise the pictures had to be to tell a narrative story. So it was uh, a great education, not to mention, since I kind of worked my way up from a runner to a production assistant, to a production coordinator, to a production manager, till I was producing. So, you know, I ordered every single piece of equipment, every single right. meal that was ordered, everything, you know, and I understood the schedules and I understood so much more about making films. Right. And it really helped me when I was writing to, to know that because I was imagining how the film would be made, not just, wasn't just a pie in the sky yeah. kind of thing. It was a very, you know, precise thing that I knew how it worked. And so. Yeah, that practical knowledge is like so key. That's amazing. And, you know, it's what I always tell young people if they want to get into the film business. I'm like, take any job you can get on a film set. It's so educational. I feel like that's one of the biggest problems for writers is that somehow they're not part of the filmmaking, yep. the actual filmmaking that goes on. And I think that is such a huge mistake to not have the writers on the set so that they understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, why some things need to be changed, what happens in the moment, what happens if an actor can't make a moment work. There's just so much to be gained. I think that's such a good point, Callie. I've never thought about that. But so often you get a script and you as the producer can make those leaps. But the writer is just writing what's in their head. And if they've never really experienced production, it's like they have no idea what <laughs> they're writing that's impossible, right? And that is so brilliant. Or you can be there and you can see that something isn't working. And so one little change. Yeah can make something work. Were you talking to people as you were coming up with scenes or were you keeping it very private and intimate? There were one or two people that I let know that I was writing it and that I would even show the scenes too, but I didn't want any feedback. You know, because I knew so many people. I mean, you know, first of all, it's like when you're young and you live in Los Angeles and you tell somebody you're an actor, you know, it was especially back then, you know, this is all pre Me Too. This is pre, you know, even the term sexual harassment didn't exist yet, you know, so it right, was a right. really gnarly free for all. So, you know, it was just a time that I, I don't know, I felt really careful about who I let know I was doing this because everybody, I mean, you know, the valet Parker had a screenplay. Everybody had a screenplay. And I just didn't want to, I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to survive any negative feedback. Yeah. I mean, I knew if I said I was working on a screenplay and somebody said, yeah, you and everybody else, that it would be enough to knock the wind out of my sails. So I didn't spread it around, which was interesting because then nobody really knows I'm writing it. And then the next thing they know, Ridley Scott's directing my movie, <laughs> It was so crazy. No, it's fucking insane. It's like, well, let me just say one more thing, which is like, if I think of perfect screenplays in terms of like, sort of methodical development of character, I think of your movie. 
And how the fork did you know how to do that? Like, I don't, I don't like, were you just like a great lover of, I mean, you, you must just be a genius in in some ways, right? I think that must be it. I mean, I I can't think of it any other (laughs) explanation other than I'm just a stone genius. No, I didn't. (laughs) I'm definitely not that or else there would be more evidence (laughs) to support that than there currently is. Um, uh, I, I wish. But I did feel like I was being guided in some way, Mm, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I was very much paying attention to it, you know, because I knew that they were going on this journey of actualization where I was watching. I mean, I understood on some subliminal level that I was watching women who were taking off Mm -hmm. the chains of what Mm -hmm. society expects of them, yep. you know, and that we were going to see women in their purest form because, you know, I'd been having conversations for years where, you know, I would hear somebody go, women don't like this or women like that or women don't want to see this or women. And I uh-huh. was like, we don't know what women want yeah, because we have been socialized to the point of including cold from the gene pool, you yep. know? Yep. Yep. So, we don't know what women want. Yep. We know what the world wants of women, but we don't know what women themselves want. Yep. I mean, do women really want to like put themselves into these shoes that freaking destroy your feet? Is yeah. that really what women want? Right. Right. Or is it something else? <laughs> you know, like we'll never know the whole, we're fish in water, you know, we're living in an environment where what we want is so low on the list of things people care about and what we're told we want seems almost crazy. Yeah. And I just, you know, I always had that feeling. And so that was your North star. Yeah. And so it was like watching these two women kind of find out how strong they were, find out what they wanted for themselves, like find out or realize that they had never even allowed themselves a dream that met their potential, that what they expected of themselves was so little. I'm kind of crying right now. I mean, seriously. Well, I just felt like, you know, I'd go to the movies and I would see women that I was like, I don't want to be like them. I mean, it's certainly the movies of the 40s, mm-hmm. those women, the 30s and 40s, mm-hmm. the Barbara Stanwicks and the Jean Arthurs and the Irene Dunns and the Carol Lombards and the Catherine Hepburns and the Hedy Lamars and all of those women, you know, yeah. and I'm leaving out Joan Crawford and Betty Davis. And there were actors that were just brilliant. And you got to see them in the in their full womanhood, even though the movies themselves could have been trite or not taking on big issues. You got to see whole women. Yeah. And then you go to the 70s and women are like decoration, yes. you know, with the exception of Alice doesn't live here anymore and a few others. Yeah. Women were there to tell you something about the man. Yeah. Another movie that I always use as an example of the negative, like the first um, Raiders of the Lost Ark movie, the Karen Allen character. Yeah. I loved. I was so excited when I saw that. The second movie, you know, is this kind of like screechy. Yeah. I was just, I was like, that's disappointing to not have a woman that was as strong and every bit the match for him. And I don't know. What do you attribute that to? Because it really was like, 70s to 80s really did minimize the feminine and the female character. Whereas I, I, I think of what you're talking about in the 40s and they were like, those women had gumption and, you know, and I, and like what, and not that this is a conversation about that, but I'm just so curious, like what shifted? I think it was just pure feminist backlash. I mean, you know, uh-huh. that, I mean, that was the beginning of Rush Limbaugh and all those guys and feminazis and, I mean, just think back to how hostile the world was for a woman like Gloria Steinem. There was a whole column in men's magazines where they would just destroy her. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They were just horrible 
about her and anybody feminist and feminists were referred to as gorillas and they just did everything they could to denigrate it. There's always been some kind of really fierce backlash and it just kind of keeps happening. Morning, ladies and gentlemen, this is a robbery. Now, if nobody loses their head, nobody will lose their head. Simon said, y'all lie down on the floor, please. Right away. Ma'am, could you get down? Not you, sir. Let's see who win a prize for keeping their cool. Okay, so are you writing this out longhand? Are you like walking along the beach? Yes, exactly. I was doing yeah. all of those things. I was waking up in the middle of the night writing scenes. Literally, oh my god, the scene where Louise says, "If he, you hear anything, just hang up." Yes, <gasps> that scene where she calls Daryl. I literally woke up in the middle of the night and wrote that and went back to sleep. It was so strange. Oh, that scene is so genius and so funny. Like the way she performs that scene is one of my favorite moments. It's so great. Oh, I love it too. I'm, you know, forever in never to be repaid debt for that performance. Okay. So you're writing longhand. How long is that taking you? A year long, couple years? Like you're working full time. I'm working, you know, I'm, but I'm freelance working. So, you know, you're in prep for two weeks and then you shoot for three days or yeah. if you're lucky, yeah. most of the time you shoot for tw- 24 straight hours. <laughs> that was how we did it back then. Right, you know? right. We're, we're going to be out of here in 20 hours. <laughs> like no union rules. You made a, <laughs> yeah, you made a deal for a flat rate. A day is 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. just That's awful. <laughs> the eighties. What we used to do then would kill me now. <laughs> totally. It would kill You'd me. You'd be canceled. You'd, or yes. whomever, whomever would be canceled. Yes. Oh, forget it. It was ridiculous. And so, you know, I didn't have any expectations that anything was gonna happen with what I thought was such a great idea. I just knew that I had to get it out. And I made this promise to myself when I started writing it that I would finish it because I had so many unfinished things, you know, every short story that I'd written just kind of like abruptly stops, you know. Yeah. But I had the great fortune of knowing the ending Mm. because when the idea landed the ending was right there and so it was really an amazing experience to kind of attempt this thing that I had never attempted before I had a really low set of expectations for myself all I had to do was just write a scene yeah you know beginning middle and end and to me like you know, if they were like, you want to teach a screenwriting class, I would say, yes, beginning, middle, and end. Yeah. Every scene has one. Yeah. Stack them all up so they make some kind of sense. Go. Okay. So you're writing your script because I want to bring this back to like why it hit a nerve at the time that it did and how you even got managed to get it made, right? Because like this was not the trend. I mean, I remember when it came out and it was just such a lightning bolt because it was so different. When you were writing it, did you feel like there was a groundswell of like your friends and you talking about how ridiculous? No. Okay. I did not feel that. I didn't feel it and I want it, and I didn't understand why other people weren't feeling it. And I didn't understand why, you know, these young women would show up to these music video shoots and, you know, they were just there solely to be objectified and that why they were okay with that. I only had one time, I, I, I'll never forget this, I was working and I, and I can't even remember who the music video was for, but I'm in the production trailer and somebody comes and knocks on the door and it's this young woman and she's one of the dancers and she says, I have to go. And I said, okay, what's going on? And she said, this isn't what I thought I was signing up for. Mm. And I'm like, okay. She said, I'm dressed like a whore. Mm. People are touching me inappropriately. Oh. And I can't do it. Yep. And I said, I understand. And she goes, and it's really such a bummer because I really need the money. Uh huh. And I went, oh, I'm going to pay you. Yeah. I was so happy to have somebody finally object. Yep. I wrote the check right then and there because it was like, wow, I can't believe everybody goes along with this. Like, do they not see that we're just hurting ourselves with this shit? Yeah. So no, I wasn't seeing it everywhere. But at the time the movie came out, by the time the movie came out, there had been some kind of shift. And Diane Feinstein and Barbara Boxer were running for office. Yeah. And so Thelma and Louise coincided kind of perfectly with that. 
And that was when the whole Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas oh. thing went down. And I got to meet Anita Hill. Oh, my God. Who was one of the most elegant, distinguished, dignified, yeah. really smart, really just oh. in every way, a noble human being. Yeah. No, it makes me cry. Like that poor woman. And what they put her through yep. was unconscionable. Yep. And, you know, that all coincided with the movie coming out. So there was obviously something in the air because all of these things, me writing this movie, it getting made. I mean, what are the chances that of all the movies that Ridley Scott could make, that he would make this one. I mean, it was so crazy. Okay, so take me back. So you finish writing it and like, tell me the process You and what happens. So I gave the script to a woman that I had been working with quite a bit in the last couple of years, Amanda Temple. Her husband was Julian Temple, the film director. And we were great friends and I asked her if she would read the script and if she liked it, would she produce it with me because I was going to try to direct it. And again, pie in the sky idea, but I just thought, you know, surely there's somebody I can rope into giving me $5 million. <laughs> People are doing it all the time. <laughs> I mean, I just literally thought, I don't know why I can't. All these other people who can. I love it. And I saw, you know, people working in the business that I just didn't think were that talented, to be honest. And it was kind of like, all they have is drive. So if you have drive and you have talent, then maybe you can reach that first rung on the ladder. So I just gave it to Amanda and said, let me know what you think. And she loved the script. She loved it. And everybody was kind of responding really positively. So we started shopping it around a little bit. We had a couple of meetings and sometimes people would go, well, how are you going to change the ending? Uh huh. And I was like, let's go. Yeah. You know, I was just like, we're not even going to stay for this meeting. When you say you were taking meetings, like was Amanda, like you were new to the film business. She knew people. She knew people. Okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah. She knew, she knew lots more people than I did. I didn't know a lot of people in the movie business. And basically what we were looking for was somebody for financing. Yeah. Because that's what we had to find first was the money. Anyway, one of the people that she ended up giving it to was Mimi Polk, who was working with Ridley. Mm. And she read the script and said, I would love to show this to Ridley. And at that point, I was like, oh, no, uh -huh. you know, my dream is over. You know, a real director is going to read this and say it's <laughs> sh really shitty. And right. But I was just like, OK, well, it's got to happen. Then they came back and said, you know, we'd like to produce it. Oh, my God. And at the same time, Amanda found out that she was pregnant oh. with my goddaughter, Juno Temple. Oh, my God. Of course. Only in Hollywood. Amazing. The great Juno Temple. Oh, um, delightful. So then things got really weird. You know, I started having meetings with Ridley Scott. And so he was like, I'm going to produce this for you. We're going to find a director together. Correct. Okay. And... You know, we really did. He talked to so many people. But I kept saying to him, why aren't you directing it? And he would be like, mm, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh -huh. blowing me off. And then, you know, it just like more and more people. I was just like, Ridley, this is crazy, you know, because we were going through the script. And he was just soaking it all in so much that I was kind of like, who else am I going to, you know, who's going to go through this process like this and understand this movie visually and otherwise the way he is? So he was spending the time with you to continue to develop it and like sharpen it up and whatever. It was more like, what could we lose? Because the script was, I think, like 130 pages or something. Okay, okay. But it wasn't like we... We didn't change very, you know, yeah. just little things. I mean, most of the changes we made, we made later based on locations. But he was invested as like a real producer. He was yeah, in it with you. for sure. Okay, got it. I think at a certain point, Dick Donner mm -hmm. was interested. And I think when Dick Donner got interested, something clicked in with Ridley where he went, mm, I don't know, maybe I should do it. <laughs> I'm so glad that he did. I mean, oh my God, me too. You know, me too. He was able to bring the visual 
style to it that I really, you know, I so imagined things a very particular way, you know, Mm -hmm. and we would talk about it in the beginning. I was like, it should look like a Sears catalog come to life, you know, Mm. in in Thelma's house. Yeah. And as we go on, it's got to just turn into this almost more magical, photorealistic, kind of almost Maxfield Parish Uh kind of light. Uh And we should feel like we're in a different dimension, kind of, you know? Yes. And it was amazing that he was able to pull that off, you know? I mean, obviously, the landscape itself comes to that. Sure. Years before, when I was making, I think it might have been an Estee Lauder commercial, and we were shooting in Monument Valley. Mm Mm-hmm. I was the production coordinator. And so all the camera equipment had to come off. We flew it all to Arizona or wherever we, and I had to like load all the camera equipment into a van and I had to drive the van to the location. And I'm driving the van through Monument Valley on a full moon night. And it was just the most incredible Mm. experience. And I just had this really, I can't, almost an epiphany. That ended up in the movie. Yes. You know? Uh, And it was just really amazing that if I hadn't had that job, if I hadn't been there on that full moon night, you know, would Thelma and Louise ever have existed? Right. So it's funny how, you know, experiences that happen years in advance of something can really affect you in ways that you don't know until later how profound it actually was. I feel awake. Good. Wide awake. What? You're real out that long, aren't you? Well, I may be an outlaw, darling, but uh, you're the one stealing my heart. Callie, Ridley, I mean, was such a busy filmmaker. He doesn't get a lot of rest. So then he says, I'm going to direct it. Is it like, I want to direct it next, or I'm going to direct it someday, or was it very immediate? It was very fast. The whole thing was was very fast. I mean, Mm. when you hear how long it takes to get most things made, and it really does, this was one of the fastest ever. I mean, I wrote this script in 88. I think I finished it in August of 88, and then I didn't show it to anybody for a while. So, I mean, basically... We spent the year of 89 shopping it around and then going through the process with Ridley, and they started shooting (laughs) summer of 1990. And who financed it again? Remind me who your studio was. It was Pathé and MGM. There was, there were, I know there was like a shuffle in the actresses, right? Yeah, there was a a lot of casting conversations went on, and it was very touch and go there for a while. I mean, because, you know, I mean, when when I thought about directing it for myself, I wanted to have like... Francis McDormand and Holly Hunter. I thought they would have been incredible. And I mean, at the time they were saying like, what about Goldie Hawn? What about Cher? What about, you know, and I was kind of like, listen, I just want it to feel real. And at some point I wanted actors that weren't going to overwhelm the piece itself, you know, and there's a certain thing when you get a movie star that's really huge as they were at the time, sometimes it's hard for the peace to rise to it. It becomes a thing for them. Yes. I mean, it was a painful process because it's like, you know, as a writer, it is what it is until it becomes something else. And once, you know, as it gets made, it becomes less and less yours. You know, you have to share the process. Yeah. And so it ends up being, you have these really painful moments where you're like, is this person going to really understand exactly what this moment means? It's painful. It's just, I think for any writer, it is. Was anyone auditioning? Was anyone going on tape? Were there chemistry reads? I'm sure that there were, but I was not part of that process. You know, typically in Hollywood, unfortunately, it's exactly the opposite in television, which is, I think, why so many writers have gone to television with such a vengeance is that you have control as a writer. Yeah. And you don't as a feature writer. You're just kind of like, thank you. You're replaceable. You're an idiot. Get out of here. <laughs> you know, and it's just, right, right. <laughs> it's just a really undignified experience. <laughs> Hollywood, I would say that just generally can be very undignified. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. 
So I was so happy when they landed on Gina and Susan. It was because I, I just felt like that was proportionally the right thing to do. They were both really strong, solid actors who lost themselves in the part, you know? Yeah. And that was what I wanted more than anything. Were you on set? Like, did you go with them to... I went and visited a couple times. I wasn't on set that much. Yeah. You know, again, that was typically how it was. The writers... I mean, when I'm directing, I love having the writers on set because it's like, there's so many details when you're directing. There's so many things that you're trying to get. Yes. That it's so wonderful to have a writer that goes you know, don't forget that this scene is about this moment. Da, 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 da. You know what I mean? And you're like, yes, thank you for saying that right now. Thank you. Cause I could have forgotten that. Totally. Totally. I want to go back to just the, the production of it all because Ridley was just sort of casting these great actors. I mean, across the board, it's such a well cast film and you were just sort of getting the updates as writers are wont to do, right? Like it wasn't like you were. Yes. I mean, I did suggest Michael Madsen. He had been in a movie that a friend of mine was making and I saw him and thought he was great. And I thought he'd be perfect for Jimmy. Oh, he was so good. And I think they read him for everything else, but Jimmy. And then finally they did read him for Jimmy and Ridley was like, we found the greatest guy for Jimmy. (laughs) (laughs) Great. Well, I mean, I think the irony is you get like a lot of criticism for this being like an anti-male film, but I actually, aside from Thelma's husband, who's just, you know, abominable and obviously Harlan, like I think the three Jimmy and um, Kaitel's character and Brett, I mean, they're just wonderfully rich characters. Again, I, I feel like that is pure sexism because male characters in, I've made this point 10 million times, you know, male characters, male writer directors can show male characters doing the most heinous imaginable things and they don't get criticized for negative portrayals of males. They just don't. Yeah. I mean, Martin Scorsese's entire career is built on showing <laughs> the worst. Totally. That yes. Masculinity has to offer. Yes. You know. Yes. And I don't hear him getting criticized as being anti-male. I think you know his worst characters are celebrated. And we have people calling me a man hater because a rapist gets shot. I mean. Yeah. Okay, you're making my point. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just sit here and <laughs> let you carry on. <laughs> so, so the casting you didn't have to do with, but I thought it was like perfectly cast. I really did. I did too. And that is, um, again, incredible luck. Chris McDonald. Oh, he's great. Gina suggested him. They had mm. been engaged apparently many years before. and she, yeah, And she said he would be great which I don't know if that's a compliment necessarily, but he is, I love him. I've worked with him again. I mean, he's one of the greatest, funniest guys on earth. I absolutely adore him. Oh, so good. He was so fun in that movie. The pizza moment. I know, when he steps (laughs) on the pizza. So good. So good. He's just, Um, I don't know. I mean, it's so wonderful. And then, of course, there's Brad, you know. Yes, I mean, I know you've been asked this a bajillion times, but... I didn't meet him until the day I went to set and he had already been cast. And because we're in our 31st year of existence, you know, I've a lot of these stories I have told before. So please forgive me for repeating myself. But yeah, I go to the set and Ridley says, have, did you meet the guy that's playing JD? And I said, no. And he goes, go, go introduce yourself. He's a base camp. And so I go and I ask the AD where, and so I knock on the honey wagon door and, you know, he's in a honey wagon, which I love, right? Yeah. (laughs) Which is just like an elongated eight room long trailer, horrible trailer. Just like in these little tiny cubicles that (laughs) the actor sits inside until called to set. And it's just like being in a little tiny pen. Um, <laughs> I knock on the door and then you have to go back down the step so he can open the door. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he kind of leans out. He doesn't have his shirt on. Oh, <laughs> I'm Jesus. just like, he's all made up. You know what I mean? So he's ready to go. Glossed him up. Yeah. And I'm just like, wow, <laughs> that's kind of perfect. And he was such a sweetheart. And I mean, I didn't know him from Adam. Nobody did. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I had no idea the job he would do or anything. I just knew that he was certainly not going to be hard to look at. Yeah. So he had that going for him, if nothing else. But I knew that Ridley was going to get some amazing performance out of him, you know, as he did with everyone. Yeah. So it was so gratifying to see how well he did. I mean, he really took his moment. I remember going to see it and I saw it on a Friday that Friday it opened and I went with friends and went home to my dad's house who we both love and know. Yes. And I said, dad, this guy, he's going to be a huge star. And my dad remembers that conversation. My dad claims he told David Fincher about Brad Pitt. Well, you know, the word got out about Brad very quickly. <laughs> it wasn't a big secret. <laughs> Hollywood's worst kept secret. <laughs> um, and then Harvey Keitel. I mean, we cannot, like, was that, how did that come to be? Just- you know, I don't know exactly how he came to the part. And, and you know, again, I felt like it, that was such a wonderful choice. You know, I mean, certainly everybody knew him as a New York actor and, to kind of see him take on this Southern cop was really fun. I think he enjoyed it. And he played it just exactly with the right amount of compassion, the right amount of understanding and humor. And God, again, so lucky, so lucky to have your first, just to be able to get to that level on my first screenplay, to have those actors in my first screenplay. Oh, Jesus. Come on. That doesn't happen. It's like a murderer's row of the best actors of all time. You know, and a tribute to Ridley, obviously, that so many people wanted to work with him. I mean, it was just an amazing experience, which I I know I've said amazing experience like 3,000 times, but that doesn't even come close to what it actually felt like in the moment to be watching this thing suddenly taking shape and then become real and then become even more than anybody ever imagined could possibly happen with it. It was like a week after it was out, it was on the cover of Time Magazine. All this sturm and drawing about how it, oh geez, whether society was going to end or young girls were going to start slaughtering people in the streets or, you know, it was just hilarious and a little troubling. Jesus Christ. Some of the writing about it was so hyperbolic. Yeah. Liz Smith wrote, you know, I wouldn't take any impressionable young women to see this. And I was just like, oh, man, come on. Well, yeah, keep taking them to the movies where they end up as dead bodies. Okay. Yeah. You know, if you're okay with that. <laughs> yeah. And and were Gina and Susan, what was their dynamic? Was there true camaraderie and friendship? Yes, for sure. Yeah, they really did. I mean, they've, they were wonderful to each other and they were really supportive of each other. And they both understood that they were doing something that they hadn't often gotten a chance to do. You know, certainly a female buddy movie was not that much in demand, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and Susan was sort of the more established of the two at that at the time in my in my memory. Is that is that your memory of it? I mean, I think she had been around longer. Yeah. But Gina was already, you know, making a name for herself. You know, she was already somebody who, I mean, I felt like Gina was a big get for us. Okay. I thought she was perfect. She was, she wasn't like toiling in obscurity and this was her big break. I mean, she had already distinguished herself. And the budget was, my research of the budget was like, it was 16 million or something. Yeah, something like that. Between 16 and 18, I think. I've heard 18. Did that feel like enough to you? Well, from my perspective, you know, I who had been planning on getting five million dollars to shoot it, yeah, right, a couple million together. You Mm -hmm. know, it's it seemed exorbitant, but you know, then he's got helicopter shots, and he's got you know, he's got all kinds of stuff that I wouldn't have been able to afford. Yeah, crop dusters and private jets, and you know, blah blah blah. So. There were all kinds of things. And I mean, he got the big toys. He got the cranes. It has such an epic scope. Like he must have had all the things. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, very much so. And he'd shot so many car commercials in his life. You know what I mean? So yeah. Was, I mean, he was such a pro coming out of the UK. That was what they were known for. Yeah. Um, I want to just go back because you were on set for a bit. And I'm always interested to hear sort of lasting memories. You know, I'll tell you, the first time I went to set, 
they were shooting the scene at the um, Silver Bullet. And it was the first time I'd seen Gina and Susan as Thelma and Louise. And wow, what a weird experience because you have these two people that live in your head and now they're outside of your body and they're actually talking and they're saying the things that you wrote to each other. And it sounds exactly like the way they talk. And it's just amazing to get to do that. It just makes me love all the pain that you go through when you're writing something because it's just one of the least fun things. I mean, I take that back. Writing Thelma and Louise was the most fun I ever had. I've said that a million times, and it's to this day. I never enjoyed anything more than sitting there working on those scenes. It was just, aside from everything that happened after it, the actual writing of it was an absolute joy because I was discovering all this stuff that I didn't know about the characters, myself, the way my brain works, everything. It was just fun. And after that, it was never as fun again. I mean, I've had moments where when you write a scene that you really love, you kind of brush up against it. But at that point, it was just almost all flow. And when I didn't know what was going to happen next, I could just go away for a week or two weeks or whatever. And then suddenly the next thing would come. I did write it sequentially, even though I knew certain scenes were going to happen Later, I tried to write it in order so that each thing was kind of built upon the thing that came before it, which I still find incredibly helpful. You know, I mean, if I'm really stuck sometimes and I've outlined and all of that, I mean, a lot of this has to do with having now written for television a lot more. But at the time, I didn't even know what an outline was, so I didn't <laughs> didn't ever do anything as controlled is that. I mean, I didn't even want to know really how to write a screenplay. I remember picking up a Sid Field book in a bookstore one time and opening it and seeing a diagram and going, oh, I wonder if I should draw a diagram. And I went home and kind of tried to draw a diagram. And I was just like, no, I won't ever, don't do, this is bad. Don't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because I just knew for myself, even though I think it's a really useful tool for a lot of people. I mean, people's brains work in different ways. Yeah. I just knew for myself that If I applied too many rules or if I read too much about how to do it, that I would think I wouldn't be able to do it. Right. You know, I was fighting this massive lack of confidence in myself. Yeah. That I had been experiencing for years. And that's a whole other, you know, kind of psychological story that I won't bore anybody with. But, you know, I think everybody wrestles with you know, what am I here for? What am I supposed to be doing? What are the limits of my abilities? And why do I have them? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So I was really wrestling with myself for a lot of it. But for some reason, working on that script, a lot of that stuff just fell away. Mm -hmm. And I had gotten to this point in my life where I was so tired of not expecting enough of myself, Mm. you know, yep, or settling or whatever. And so much of that came out in the movie, you know? Yes. That whole line, you get what you settle for. You know, that is the truth. Yeah. Like, so why would you? Like, what if this is the only life you have? Don't you want to do something? Or at least try. Yeah. And so it was such a liberating experience for me personally, just the writing of it and the completion of it. Oh, so good. You know, I have all these other questions, ideas for specific scenes, and that Rastafarian scene I was just thinking well, about. That, that happened on the set. So that wasn't in the script. In the script, I think just an old truck came by. So that happened. That was uh, that was all Ridley, and I think the guy actually worked. I think he was one of the crew members. Oh, my God. That's brilliant. Yeah. So, that's a good I one. mean, that was just another happy accident. Yeah. Accident. I mean, I don't know if it's an actual accident, but I mean, one of those things that just worked out so great. Yeah, things just fall in your favor sometimes. That was 
that was a really yeah and you know it was wonderful because for the pacing of the movie it needed that moment it needed that lightness at that moment you know because the tonal shifts in the movie i mean that was one of the things ridley and i used to talk about a lot because he would go do you think that's going to work do you think that's going to be funny i mean they've just shot a guy do you think it's going to be funny and i was like yeah i think it's going to work i i had no doubts that it could work and it was great watching it work you know and i think he was as happy as anybody that it did it's so funny you say that cuz like now that you're saying that i'm like it's a very funny movie there are a lot of great comedy in that movie and it's sort of overwhelmed by its impact but you know i love movies that have everything that you laugh you cry you walk away thinking things you weren't thinking before let's jump ahead to like when you're first presented with a cut like are you shown something yeah that's a work in progress or tell me about that i got to see a couple of the cuts and every time it was it was so overwhelming you know because the movie worked Mm -hmm. and so it wasn't a matter of oh my God, what are we going to do? There was never any panicking. I thought the musical choices were spectacular. Totally. I just, I loved it. I mean, I was filled with gratitude. I mean, there were so many ways that the movie could have gone wrong. In the wrong hands, Yes, the, it could have been such a debacle. I mean, I guess that's like a big question for me. It's like, how did you know that Ridley Scott could handle the themes of the, did he just? All of it was feeling, you know? Yeah. He he just, I mean, it wasn't like Ridley was some big, well-known feminist. I don't, you know, I mean, he <laughs> yeah, just, totally. it wasn't that. Exactly. You know? you know, I felt like it was something that he was doing because he really was attracted to the material. Not because he felt like, oh my God, this movie's going to be a huge hit or any of those things. Like, we weren't talking about that. We never talked about it in anything other than artistic terms. It was always about story. Yeah, and never about anything else, uh, not about how it was going to do, how, nothing, you know? So then the movie works. My memory and my research is like, it came out in May. So you guys went to the Cannes Film Festival. Did you Did you attend? I did not, which was painful, I, I will admit. Okay. I wanted to go and, you know, no one would really raise their hand and say, yeah, come. And so that that was like the first time I was like, but wait a minute, <laughs> you know? Like, this is yours, yeah. And I think that's something a lot of writers go through. So at a certain point, you you must have started to be included in the rollout of the film because it was a success. It started to get huge critical acclaim and then also awards. Which, again, a complete shock. I, I, I am going to tell you quite honestly that every single time I was getting dressed to go to an award show, I was thinking, well, this will be fun because I'll get to see all these people and everything. But never once did I think I've got this, you know, because yeah. I was like, they're going to give it to a real writer. They're going to give it to somebody who's been in the business. They're not going to give it to me, you know. But, but Callie, didn't you feel that thing at a certain point where you became the darling of the season. Like I've observed that, right. Where suddenly it's like, this is different. This is so novel and unique. And aren't we a great industry for like acknowledging this, like this new voice and, yes. you know, and I think Th it, that, but also boys in the hood was out and John Singleton. And, uh, you know, that was yes, an incredible yes. movie. You know what I oh mean? That God, was such a great right. movie. Yeah. And, and, um, Grand Canyon with Larry and Meg Kasdan and Richard Legravenous with Fisher King yep. and Bugsy, you know, I mean, so there were some great movies that year. So I was among a lot of darlings, you know what I mean? I mean, John Singleton was, you know, that was just, that was a magnificent piece of work. A crop of like new voices. Right. And that is so exciting. It really was. And it was fun because, you know, it's like that, you know, it's like, that's your class, you know, that like each, that's your graduating class. Right. And so you kind of have these relationships with people over the years because you all went through that experience together. Do you have any like specific memories of moments that like kind of? Well, I mean, each are... one was a shock. The, the night that I won the Academy Award, I was seated next to Meg and Larry Kasdan. And I can't remember which of their sons, I think it might be Jake was sitting there. And 
Larry leans over and he goes, you're going to win. So when you do, will you give him a kiss so all his friends can see him on television? (laughs) (laughs) And it was so great that he did that because it gave me a chore. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I was just having some kind of weird out of body experience. And that was the one, even though by that time I had already won a, you know, a golden globe and a writer's guild award and they were, you know, I was getting awards from places that had never even done it before, you know, it was just yeah, crazy. Yeah. But I, that was the one I was like, you do not get your hopes up because there is no way, no way that you're getting this one. Oh, you know, my God. I just knew that I want, you know, and people would tell me, oh, you're going to win. And I was just like, I couldn't even let it in. I just had no reason to believe it. Okay, walk me through that night then. Like you're you're getting dressed up. It's the the fanfare. You're sitting in like one of the front rows. Are you nervous? Are you anxious? Are you tr- are you did you have a drink? Like just walk me through that. Well, I'm s- certain I had a drink. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I just I was trying to stay very present. It's very much like, you know, whenever somebody's getting married, I always tell them, look, it go, it's over really fast. So really try to stay present. And I tried to adopt the same thing that night as well, to just like take it in, enjoy being there. My mom was there. My brother was there. My, you know, I was there with my husband. And it was one of those things where I just thought, wow, I'm just going to like enjoy how great this is that when I started this journey, I was working on crappy music videos and now I'm at the Academy Awards. Yeah. And this all happened really fast. So it was really fun to be able to participate just at all forget about winning to just be able to be there. And how did you keep your wits about you on stage? I always, I'm always so curious about this, you know, people who aren't actors to have to like get up in front of literally a billion people. Like how you just stay present again, I guess. I mean, I had to stay present. Also, I wrote a speech finally because I was afraid I had gotten up so many times without a speech because I was always so certain that I wasn't going to win that I never bothered to write a speech. And so several times before I had gotten up and had to just wing it. And so I thought, okay, just in case, I don't want to embarrass myself in front of the whole world. So I'd like make these notes just on a piece of paper, nothing, you know, I didn't write out any big thing because again, I didn't want to like set myself up, write a speech that I never got to give. Yeah. They give you 45 seconds. I'm like, what can you possibly say in 45 seconds anyway? Yeah. So I get up there and I open it up and I've written it in pencil and I just can't even focus on it. You know, I can't really even see it. (laughs) And my hands are kind of shaking and I just am like, I can't believe that it's happening. And so I'm just looking out and I'm, just trying to like you know do anything that sounds like a thank you yeah there's no way you can express the amount of gratitude that you're actually feeling in the time allotted which is one of the flaws of award shows you know but it was just one of those moments where you're kind of like a lot of the struggle is falling away yeah so just enjoy that you've made it this far because you don't know what's going to happen after this. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just the last place you ever expect to be. I just felt really, really, really grateful. Was that the night of your life? Like, did you just go and have the most fun ever? Like, was that, it was sort of like you had hit the mountaintop with the even knowing? Yes and no. I mean, yes, it's a lot. You get, you know, you get taken backstage and you're standing in front of press for a while and, you know, the lights are flashing and people are asking you questions and you're trying to the best of your ability to answer them without repeating yourself. And it's very surreal. It's, it's, and it's a lot like work. It's not, just so glamorous you know it's like you're doing this press line and then you're doing this press line and then you have to go do this and all of it is in support of the movie and everybody there is working all the journalists are working all the photographers are working all the actors are working everybody's working and you too are working you know and so it does 
feel like work a little bit. And yet at the same time, you're all dressed up and you're, yeah, and you're hobnobbing and, it's, and, you know, you know, yeah. and you're holding this heavy award and, you know, you're just like, I can't believe I get to take this thing home. <laughs> uh, all right, my dear. All right. You're amazing. Truly you. such a fun interview. Thank you so um, much. Thanks, Callie. And the Oscar goes to... Callie Curry for Thelma and Louise. Well, for everybody that wanted to see a happy ending for Thelma and Louise, to me, this is it. <laughs> I have a lot of people I want to thank, so I'll get started. Ridley, I couldn't thank you in 45 years, much less 45 seconds, so I won't try now. Gina and Susan, I think you've made the world a better place <laughs> for those performances. I love you. I want to thank my husband, who helped me so much in ways that I could never tell him and it wasn't by being like Daryl. <laughs> he wasn't the model for any of the characters. In fact, um, my brother was. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I really want to thank my mother who taught me everything about love and loyalty that a gal could ever need to know and all my friends and family. Thank you. Thanks. How awesome is Callie Curry? That was so fun. Yeah. And it was really cool to listen to her as women who run a production company now. And she was kind of a pioneer. Yeah. As a woman believing in her own story and not changing it for the way that the studios that were run by men yep. wanted her to change her story. Yeah. And I thought that was incredible for the time. And I loved when she talked about just having kind of the struck by lightning moment where yeah. the whole story came to her and she saw the ending. And I think that is, you said it in the podcast. I think that's genius. Yeah. And I think that is so rare. And that's when you know that you've struck gold when you have a moment like that. Yeah. And I just think she was incredibly brave and she can talk about this time in hindsight, knowing that she had to face all of these obstacles as a woman in this industry. Yeah. So I think it was really great hearing you as a as a producer now interviewing someone who kind of paved the way for you. You know, we talk about the films that we want to make as producers, films that have real impact, but are also events and feel like they're commercial. And that movie to me, I remember seeing it when I was in high school absolutely hit those two marks on the head. It like changed the culture in a very significant way. And then it was also the most fun, wild ride to watch. The visuals, the music, the performances, everything about that film, what, what I just thought was so genius. And it also introduced Brad Pitt to the world, which I can never thank uh, Callie enough for. <laughs> <laughs> the world is a much more attractive place. It is. <laughs> it really is. I loved hearing you mentioned when you went to go see that movie in high school yeah. and remembering how much it stuck with you and it was an event. Yeah. And I think that's huge because you talk about that a lot as a producer, trying to make movies that feel like events for people. And I think Kelly knew that she was doing that. She knew that this was going to be something, even if she didn't know what it was going to be. Right. But I think there is... um there's a lack of that now. There's a lack of these events because there's so much content out there. Yeah. And so you kind of just talked about it, but for you, what made that film an event? Was it the fact that it was these two strong women embarking on this journey and it was such a cultural moment? Or, or why do you think that was an event? I think that we hadn't seen a major motion picture led by two females in that way. I mean, it just looked so cool. Everything about it, even I remember the costumes. I remember feeling like, oh my God, Gina Davis with her cut off shirt and she's wearing this trucker hat at the end and this like visual transformation from this like pink lipstick wearing housewife to this like badass woman on the road, like holding up liquor stores, not to glamorize that. But I just remember feeling like, oh, that is touching upon something I have not seen. And I think that really impacted me forever. It's like, how do you figure out how to say something that hasn't been said in a long time? That's the other thing I loved hearing Callie talk about how the women that were 
cast in the films in the 40s, they had such strength and gumption. It was like the Catherine Hepburns of the world, and they always had something to say. And then that kind of went away for a while. And so Callie obviously had that in her mind, and she gave these women such agency and gave them so much to say. And I just remember being like, yes, yes, that's what I want to achieve. And so it's so helpful just to have her, you know, in a way she has been sort of a guiding light for someone like me and has helped me sort of define what I want to achieve in my own career. It's so helpful to have that. So that was an incredible episode. Thank you all so much for listening. Continue to listen in. We post every Wednesday. Please continue to um, post and, and email us with any questions and any movies that you want us interviewing the producers of. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks so much and see you next week. Thank you.